I was really hoping for that song to go forever. <laughs> Such a beautiful song. Good morning, happy Sabbath. I am the bread of life. So we've been um, in a series of topics uh, dealing with the I am um, from Jesus, and uh, this morning is very appropriate to talk about I am the bread of life, um, for the very fact that um, we have communion, and it's part of, of, of this service. Can I ask just to put the volume down a little bit, please? Thank you. Can I ask you to open your Bibles in the book of John, chapter 6, and, and just stay there, because we're going to be talking about this chapter this morning. Um, John chapter 6, and we're going to go through um, this chapter this morning. Uh, b before we do, uh, I would like to pray. Uh, Father in heaven, this morning I truly plead with you that you can intervene uh, this morning in the message and your spirit can be felt as we open your word and learn about this important topic about you our savior our god in your name we pray amen so let me let me summarize a, a little bit of the topic this morning i'm just going to tell you um, i'm going to give you the the punchline uh, but first of all i'm going to give you a summary then i'm going to give you the line and then at the end, I'm going to give you the punch. Okay? Um, so the story in the book of um, John, chapter 6, is we have Jesus uh, that he wants to retrieve because uh, he had just heard the news that his cousin, um, John the Baptist, had been killed. So he says to his disciple, let's go somewhere so we can be at peace and just relax. So they decide to go to the other side of the lake. And once I get to the other side of the lake, uh, people see um, around the towns that Jesus was coming there, so they follow him. And so Jesus sees that, and he tells his disciples, um, um, after, after healing and, and, and doing a lot of miracles to them, uh, there were thousands of people there surrounding him. And so Jesus feels compa compassionate about them, and he says to one of his disciples, um, um, go and buy something to eat. Well, what are we going to feed them with? And he says, well, <laughs> you know, we don't have enough money. And somebody else says, oh, I found this kid with uh, some, a basket of bread and fish. So maybe, maybe, I don't know what he was trying to say with this. Maybe we can feed them with this. He was expecting Jesus to do this miracle, I guess. And so Jesus performs this miracle and he multiplies these baskets of, of, bread and, and fish and he feeds them and there's something really interesting in this in this story because um, once once he feeds them uh, it says that they collected and they managed to fill 12 baskets uh, with the pieces of, of barley bread but there's something very interesting in, in verse 14 and it says after the people saw the miraculous sign I want you to remember that word, sign, because it's very important to the story. So he collects them, and then what happens is that Jesus feels that these people were getting a little bit nervous, and they were talking about themselves, and he realized what was going on, that they wanted to make him king because of the miracles and the signs that they've been seeing him do. And so Jesus says to his disciples, get on the boat, and he moves away from the crowd, and he goes away. And so, just let me tell you something. Jesus comes not to give bread, but he comes to be bread. We got that? Jesus did not come to give bread, but to be bread. And in John 
uh, 6, 35, 48, and 51, we find this verse, this saying of Jesus that says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never, what? Will never be hungry. And who he believes in me will never be thirsty. So he gives bread, but that is not the reason he comes. And we can miss this by thinking that it's the main thing that he comes to do. Give me bread. Give me, give me, give me bread. That is not the reason he comes. And the, the problem is that he needs to take the bread out of a lot of people's hands so they may trust him as a bread. Have you experienced that? That he's taking stuff away from us so we can depend on him? We live in a very rich country, don't we? I mean, unfortunately, Billy and, I, Billy and I, we kind of like throw a lot of bread away every Monday. Because, you know, we, we've got so much bread. This is because of food pantry. He didn't come to be useful. Jesus did not come to be useful, but he came to be precious. Which is a big difference. How many Christians receive him as useful? In other words, Jesus Christ did not come into the world to assist in meeting our worldly desires. He came into the world to change our desires. So he becomes the main one, the center, the bread of life. That's the point of this sermon. Let me cl clarify something, but Jesus does care about bread, your body. But it's not the main thing. It's not the main point of what Jesus comes for. That's coming on the other side of the grave. There is going to be a resurrection one day. No more mourning, no more crying, no more tears, no more depression, no more sins. And you know the list. But that's, that's coming um, where our bodies will be transformed. And then, only then, we will be able to enjoy the fullness of the presence of Jesus. But that's not the main point of this world. He didn't come to satisfy our physical desires, but to change those desires as at the core. So he becomes our treasure, our everything. He becomes our bread. You see, Jesus came to give a sign in the multiplying of these loaves that he himself is the bread of heaven. Remember that little word that we read before? That this miraculous sign? Well, what is a sign? What's your understanding of a sign? Well, a sign is gl that glory comes into the world. Remember John 1.14 where it says, We have seen his glory. The, the, the glory of the one and only who come from the Father full of grace and truth. And shining down from the glory is this light. And this light of glorious, eternal, divine, Son of God, and shines down. And when it hits this mountain on top where Jesus was with that crowd, produces those five loaves and a couple of fish, enough food to feed a crowd. And the sign is meant to do this. That's what the sign is for. And they beheld this miracle. The crowd should have looked at the glory, the source of the sign, and not at the miracle itself. Instead, they saw this miracle and fixated on the product of this miracle and not the person of this miracle. And seeing the intention the crowd had to make him king, Jesus withdrew. Because that was not the purpose of this sign. And that's why they followed him. Remember, then 
He went up to the mountain. The disciples went on the boat. They cross the, 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 the lake. And in the middle of the lake, this storm comes. And, the, and they see Jesus walking on, on, on water. And they panicked. And they got to the other side. But when they got to the other side, people were waiting for him already. And they wanted more. And they wanted more. And they wanted more bread. And they wanted more miracles. Because it was all about them. Give me, give me, give me bread. This miracle aroused the physical interest that finally they could be delivered from bondage and be a free nation according to the prophecies, right? They were right. They were looking for someone like him. But what they failed to understand is that Jesus, through this miracle of the bread, was inviting them to look beyond their earthly problems. And understand that the real bondage was that of what? Sin. <clears throat> Jesus refers them back to the manna. And the fact that it is not the bread of sustenance that we should be worried about. But in verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and he gives life to this world. Jesus goes on to say, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And see, and this is the problem that those 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 people that had been, been fed the previous day, they were still following Jesus. You know why? Because they were still hungry. They were hungry. They were thirsty. And they couldn't understand this concept that the bread that I give you, you will never be hungry. But hang on, I'm hungry today. So the bread that you gave me yesterday doesn't work. I am the bread of life. What are you talking about? These were hard words to understand for the crowd as they grumbled about this statement. They were confused. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were also hard on his disciples. This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? After this, many of his disciples left and no longer followed Jesus. Because of his, these words that he was saying. <laughs> How can you say this? But you know, interesting that this should not have been for, a foreign to them, especially knowing that not understanding this connection between the, Meso the messianic revelation and say the story of Genesis 14, for example. In Genesis 14, uh, we have the story of Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God most high. He blessed Abraham. Remember when Abraham came in and delivered um, his, um, the, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and this king comes out and he blesses him. And what does he do? He shares bread and wine with him. And they had this kind of like communion together. That's the first recording of communion. It's not new to the New Testament, but we have it in the Old Testament. And so Melchizedek's blessing, perhaps a, a precursor to the communion we now share in Christ, underscores the timeless connection between earthly kingship, priesthood, and the divine plan unfolding throughout the scripture. And it was all about Jesus. Shouldn't they know this concept already as they made their way to the temple every week to make those sin offerings and sacrifices and be so familiar with every single item in the temple? My understanding is by the, by the time they were 12 years old, they knew exactly every single piece and part of the temple. And they knew what it signified. The ark. The lampstand, and especially the table in front of the most holy place. Exodus 25, 30. Put the bread, this is uh, the, the, the instructions given to Moses. Put the bread of the presence of this table to be before me at all times. Let's unpack that a little bit. 
John 14, 6, say, Jesus says, Jesus proclaims, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, there are no options on the route to eternal life. There is only one way. And Jesus, the bread of life, sitting in front of the Shekinah, the most holy place, is the way. How could they have missed it? This point. Then Jesus comes and says, I am the bread of life. They have read this throughout the Old Testament for hundreds of years. And they missed the point. But they failed to connect all the pieces together. And when Jesus was suggesting to them that he was the bread of life... They refused to accept him. Now, I'm flying through this because I know it's going to be a long morning. So I only had 20 minutes. I've got two minutes left. Now, let me give you the punch. Are we also missing the point? In connecting this connection between the bread of life. And the door to the most holy place, which is the presence of God, the Shekinah. You know what? When you think about it, it's nothing but justification by faith. That's what it is. Justification by faith. I love how Jesus turns this concept of the value of bread and connects it to, the, to this justification by faith only. And we read that in John 6, 28 and 29. Because they were curious. They wanted to know, what do we have to do? What, what, where do we get this bread? Because so, we don't want to feel hungry. The same way that the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, remember, where can I get this water? Because I don't want to come here every day. I don't want to be thirsty anymore. Do you want to be hungry? Do you want to be hungry for the word of God? You want to be thirsty for the Holy Spirit? This is nothing clearer than justification by faith. Then they asked him, verse 28, what must we do? They said, what must we do? To, what must we do to, to do the work God requires? What do we have to do? And Jesus answers them. The work of God is this. What does your Bible say? What does your Bible say? You have to believe, right? That's all he's saying. What is the work of God? What is the work of God? The work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. In other words, the scripture is telling you. You got to believe in me, he says. In Jesus. I hope I'm not offending anyone like the crowd or even as some of his disciples that never came back. They got offended by this statement that there is nothing we can do to deserve our gain, to gain access to the promises of God of salvation. Nothing. Do I get an amen? Do I get an amen? You like that? That we don't have to do anything? God has done everything. This is a perfect time to analyze our intention of being here in this place this morning. Why are we following this faith? Is it a Pesco Bali spiritual experience we are after? Or are we truly want the spread of life. Do we truly want the spread of life?